Good evening and a very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a very interesting discussion we have for you today because, you know, we all know that India is a paradise for any food lover. You just have to travel 50 kilometers in any direction and you will be blown by the kind of flavors and tastes that you come across. Uh, this is, of course, a factor of the layers of history, the syncretic uh, uh, mix up of, of people, cultures, etc., which is created this uh, beautiful uh, mix of foods, but it also represents living history, doesn't it? I mean, that's the ode to living history that we thought we would create with Live History India. And I, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome uh, Colleen Taylor Sen, who is a longtime uh, you know, contributor to Live History India, a member of LHI Circle, and one of the finest uh, historians who has spent decades understanding uh, the, the story of Indian food and the history it encompasses. Uh, Colleen, thanks so much for joining us today. It's really wonderful to have you on this live session. Well, thank you very much. And I would like to um, extend everyone uh, the Sarah greetings and to my Bengali friends, Shubha Mash, Ma oh my gosh, Shubha Mahashtomi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. And in a normal year, you would have been here, right, uh, Colleen? Because uh, you love Mumbai, I know, and you, you travel to Calcutta and Delhi, Kolkata and Delhi very often. But, uh, you know, I, I was reading about it. I've always read your work as a, as a culinary historian. But I didn't realize that you were also an expert on Slavic studies and you've actually taught Slavic studies and uh, you've had a very interesting career. But I want to ask you, how do you land on food history? Because sadly, you know, there isn't very much material on food history. I'm sure there's a lot of detective work that went into really putting all these books together. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think in the West, Food history certainly is growing. Um, I think it started with the Oxford Food Symposium 30 years ago, um, which really was uh, the first time people started writing seriously about the history of dishes. And um, certainly, um, you know, now in some a couple of American universities, there's programs in food history. And in Chicago, actually, we're kind of a hotbed. We have no less than three culinary history societies, um, partly due to political issues that we have three of them. But um, but but I think in India, it's still in the nascent stage. And um, I think there's so much to be explored in in um, Indian food history. I mean, my limitation was um, I was reading mainly in English. I did have a couple of things translated for me from Sanskrit, but um, if people who can who know regional languages, there's such a scope for writing about, say, Gujarati food history. There's hardly anything, written, very little written about it, and um, there's been a lot more actually about Bengali and, to some degree, Kerala food history for reasons that are kind. Of, I don't quite know why, but um, but I think there there should um, people should really be getting more interested in it. And I try to get a few tips in my talk about what sources people can use and how they might go about writing about uh, food history in India. Colleen, well, you know, when you look at food, food in India or, or the history of food, there is a tendency to look at the variants, the variety and look at, and, and for me, food really represents the layers of history, right? I mean, where the influences come in. Of course, we all know about the Columbian exchange, et cetera, which is much later in the 16th century. But, uh, you know, over the centuries, you can really see the layers come in. But uh, your talk today focuses on the continuum. And I think uh, that's a wonderful way to look at uh, food because, you know, we, are all, we often wonder what's the oldest dish in India? What did the Harappans eat? And I know archaeological evidence is now throwing light on some of these um, questions. So I'm going to hand it over to you to take us through this journey uh, of, of the story of Indian food as you see it uh, and the continuum it represents. And after which we are going to be having lots of questions from our uh, the audience members. And of course, uh, uh, would love to hear you speak about it. So please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is really going to be a, a, a 
kind of a cursory survey of um, Indian food history, I'll try to look at some general issues and I'll also try to look at some, um, you know, regional um, specific issues where we have sources of what was eaten in the past. And, um, and as many said, you know, when talking about Indian food, the emphasis is often on diversity. People say there's 21 states and, you know, you go from one village to the next, the language changes, the food changes, and there's certainly some truth in that. But there's also a commonality from ancient times that makes Indian food Indian and regardless of the region. And you can see this commonality in several areas. Um, one is ingredients. Another is um, medical and dietary theory. A third is specific issues. And the fourth is um, techniques. So I'll touch on these um, issues in the course of my talk. Um, you know, when we're writing about Indian food, there's several sources actually. And um, there's probably more than this, but one, um, as many mentioned, is archaeology, and certainly there's some very exciting discoveries coming out of the Harappan civilization now um, about what people actually ate then. If we look at the ancient texts, if we look at the Vedas, you find information about what, what they ate. Um, the Shastras, <clears throat> the epics um, have information, um, the Buddhist and Jain literature, and, um, and cookbooks. And there's some, there are some cookbooks going back to um, what often is called the medieval period. It's really a Western term, but probably from roughly 1000 to um, CE to the arrival of the, um, of the Mughal dynasty. And then in, today you have articles and books that are being written on um, food history. I mean, the most recent, someone did a wonderful, um, huge book on, on the food of Kolkata. It'd be great to see that for um, Mumbai. Another thing I'll mention is one of my projects was um, the Chicago Food Encyclopedia that I did with a couple of colleagues. And um, I mean, certainly you you could have a, a Mumbai food encyclopedia, Delhi, uh, all these things could be done. There's just such scope. And I know publishers are interested. Publishers in India would, would really like to get their hands on, on food things. So I hope that um, encourages people to write more. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Indus Valley situation, uh, civilization. Um, uh, probably most people know about that, also called the Harappan civilization. Um, at its peak, it stretched over a million square kilometers from Pakistan to Gujarat. And now we know, I mean, almost to the doors of Delhi itself. And this was such an affluent commercial society. Um, it was part of a global economy. And um, thanks to um, um, excavations, we now have a pretty good idea of what these, these Harappan people ate. And um, I'll just show this. Um, and the, actually, this was a cooking pot that was in the um, National Museum of Delhi. I couldn't believe it. It was just there. You could actually touch it. It was such a thrill. And it was it was a very big thing. Um, so um, some of the ingredients that we know they had were wheat, barley, a little bit of rice. At one point, it was not thought that rice um, was indigenous to India. But lately, uh, more recently, um, they've discovered that there were um, were varieties of long grain rice growing in India. It wasn't just something that came from China or Southeast Asia. And in one village, at least, they found um, rice in, um, in the uh, Harap, one of the Harappan villages. You have various kinds of millet, not all millets, but at least these kinds, sorghum. You have mung dal. Uh, you have eggplant and brinjal, also known as brinjal, and uh, mango, ginger, turmeric, garlic, sesame, and probably even uh, bananas. Now, bread was a staple of the diet. Uh, it was cooked in round clay ovens, uh, probably like the modern tandoor. And um, meat from buffalo, cows, goats, sheep, and wild boar was certainly a key part of the, um, uh, the uh, diet. Now, a basic way of cooking meat is to grill it directly on the fire, perhaps skewered on sticks. And sometimes people say, these are really kebabs. Sometimes people say kebabs came with the moguls, but this isn't true. I mean, every civilization that ate meat found a way of eating it um, over a fire. And probably the Indus Valley people even spiced um, the meat that they that they skewered. Um, an analysis of the residue from um, human and bovine teeth, since now as um, today too, people fed cows leftovers, um, found that um, between 2500 and 2000 BCE, the cooks were using turmeric, ginger, and garlic as spices. And um, so this is an ingredient for a 4,000-year-old Indian curry. Um, 
The fish was a, a, a very common dish because they had both a very long sea co coast, they had river. And of course, if you look at the Indus Valley seals, you see a lot of fish fe um, feature very prominently in there. And often this fish was dried and it was sold as far as 900 um, kilometers from the coast. So I think of much what, what they ate really wouldn't be too unrecognizable today. Um, just to look a little bit at foods that did originate in India, and um, it's very interesting how these, we hear so much about the Colombian exchange, what India got, the, the chilies, the tomatoes, the potatoes, the pineapple, but we don't hear so much about what originated in India and what India actually gave to the rest of the world. Um, one of the things uh, which I think is very important is eggplant, as we call it in America, um, aubergine in England, brinjal, and um, actually it was native to India, and it was called, it's been called the king of vegetables, and I think that's rightly true, because um, there's so many words for it in Sanskrit that shows you how widespread it is, and even today I think eggplant is used in pretty much every, every cuisine in India. It's a very versatile vegetable, it absorbs the gravy. Um, I know there's some people really dislike it, I think because of the texture, but certainly it's a very, um, very common. And, um, and you can see that the, one of the words in Sanskrit, vatingan, actually passed into other languages, and including um, Spanish berenjena and French and English aubergine. So this is kind of proof of its origin. Um, another uh, fruit, which is the great, um, which is the, um, oh, uh, here's a little trick question. I was looking up um, what the national, the national fruit of India is the mango, but um, I bet, Probably nobody knows what the national vegetable of India is, and I think it should be the eggplant. But actually, it's the pumpkin, <laughs> which is uh, which is very uh, interesting. Um, so to go back to the mango, um, the mango actually is also indigenous to India. Um, it originated in the northeast, and it was bred selectively um, to improve the taste and remove the fiber. And today, there's thousands of varieties. And from India, it's spread all over the world. Um, it's you, if you go to South America, you go to Africa. Even in the U.S., everywhere has mangoes, which is one of the um, other way, other fruits of the Colombian exchange that went um, went uh, westward. And the word comes uh, again from a Dravidian word, mange. Another fruit that originated in India is jackfruit, and the word comes from the Malayalam chaka. Um, I did mention about rice that originally uh, that there is proof of indigenous rice in India, and of course, then we have all the um, all the spices. Uh, which is one is pepper uh, in, scrans, in Sanskrit, Pipali, and this name came into various um, European languages. And, um, uh, and um, then, of course, you have the other spices that came, became uh, part of uh, Western cuisine. Now, um, one of India's great contributions to the world, actually, and something that was invented here, is sugar extraction. Sugarcane did not originate in India. It probably came somewhere in uh, Southeast Asia or Micronesia, but certainly the cane spread very rapidly. And it was Indians who developed the technique to convert this juice to products. And this happened around 2000 years ago. And some of these products are jaggery, uh, khan, which is the word originally of the word candy, um, sarkara, which gave root to the um, word sugar and in no European languages. And um, I think in, Indians really have the world's greatest collective streets, um, sweet tooth. Um, I don't think in any part of the world are sweets as important as they are in India. Um, people belonging to all communities give and consume sweets to celebrate, celebrate happy events, to celebrate rites of passage, such as the birth of a child or a marriage. Um, among Hindus, sweets are considered ritually pure. They can be offered to the gods and distributed as um, prasad. And um, sweets are sometimes eaten during fast or they're eaten to break a fast. And um, many sweets that we have go back to really ancient times, especially um, payasam or payasam or payesh, these various forms of rice pudding. Shrikhand and ladus are mentioned um, in very early texts. Uh, among Muslims at the end of Ramadan, um, Muslims prepare kurma, which is a thick pudding made of vermicelli, milk, and sugar. And um, there are many, many more examples. So I think um, one of the great continuities in English, in Indian cuisine is the sweets. Um, now, just turning to another um, ancient tradition, this is Ayurveda. 
And um, it's interesting that in the West, the, the, if you look at a doctor's prescription, sometimes they'll write Rx. And this originated um, as an abbreviation of the Latin verb recipere from recipe meaning take. So in the West, as well as India, at one point there was a, um, a recipes and medical prescriptions were basically the same thing because food was a medicine as it still is in Ayurveda. But I'd like to kind of um, demolish a popular belief that Ayurveda is not is vegetarian and elk and it's anti-alcoholic. This is certainly not true. This is kind of a product of this, you know, Ayurveda has become very fashionable. You have these trendy spas and things like that. And um, often they're vegetarian. If you look at the original text, and one of them is the uh, Shushruta Samhita, um, uh, this is one of the three um, key physicians in Ayurveda. Um, Shushruta, who may have been a, um, a, a, a mixture of, of, um, a mixture of um, physicians, but his name was given it to it, lived um, maybe around 600 BCE. Uh, Charaka, who lived in the second century CE, and Vagavata, who lived later in the sixth or seventh. So I use this translation of the Sushruta Samhita and some translations of, when I write about Ayurveda, because if you look at it, there's so many medicines um, for meat. And, um, uh, and it was even recommended for some um, conditions, as, were, as was garlic, mushrooms, and even alcohol. And in fact, Shushruta says that vegetables should even be avoided during therapy since they may block the channels. And as one physician wrote, the recommendations of medicine are not intended to help someone achieve virtue, dharma. What are they for then? They are aimed at achieving um, health. So um, I think this comes from confusing the three gunas with the, um, with the, you know, the, um, the uh, tamasic, raja, rajasic, and sattvic. And the, um, but now these traditions are being combined. So um, I guess it's just a, an evolution in uh, an evolution. Now, it did, they don't give really recipes as such. They just give kind of general guidelines to what you should eat. For example, for diarrhea, the person should eat venison, mutton, or goat meat, cook with the tender sprouts of a banyan tree, or the blood of a fatty goat, duly cooked with yogurt, oil, and ghee. And this is a kind of thing that they do. And these are a few dishes that um, I've kind of found uh, looking at, uh, at these texts in Shushruta Samhita that you can find um, predecessors of them. There's something like chakli kebab. Kanji is certainly a gruel, is something that really goes back a long time and is still, of course, widely eaten. You have predecessors of, of the uh, rice pudding, of, of payesh, payasam, you have things like kachori, and um, you have many other dishes too. So, um, uh, and Ayurveda met, and hospitals actually had their own, um, own farm, and uh, Charaka lists four animals that should be always kept there, and these are quail, partridge, hare, and antelope, because these live in dry areas, and their meat is considered very uh, light and easy to digest. Um, so, um, but having said that, of course, you do have a tradition of vegetarianism. And this is one of India, again, one of India's um, great, um, I think, great contributions to the world. Certainly, there was a parallel development of vegetarian in Greece around the same time. But whether that was influenced by India is one of the great mysteries of, um, of food history, that, um, that these two um, vegetarian traditions should be arise kind of simultaneously in two places. In India, it probably uh, arose around 600, 500 BCE, or perhaps earlier with the forest ascetics who renounced the world, and then the Jains. Now, today, of course, only about 30% of the population are vegetarians, but there are enormous variations by state. You have less than 1% in Kerala, Bengal, and actually in Andhra Pradesh, which is kind of interesting. And then you have around 70% in Gujarat, Rajasthan, and uh, Haryana. But um, despite this, many fasts and festivals in India, of course, are observed with a vegetarian diet. And certain feasts are vegetarian. There's fast days when people, um, when people um, fast. But vegetarianism in India, um, and fa actually fasting in India, I should say, doesn't necessarily mean um, giving up all food. 
Uh, it can, but often it just means um, renouncing certain foods. And those are the foods that um, are, are like rice and wheat that are prepared by the, um, by the plow. So people eat alternatives like um, breads made from chestnut flour and, um, and other things, which are really quite good. And um, so it's just almost an alternative diet and probably very healthy too. And certainly no one would question that um, India has the world's richest vegetarian cuisine. So I think even people who, who eat meat certainly um, would have a large proportion of, of um, vegetarian dishes in their diet. Um, now I'd like to turn to another in, um, source of information about India cuisine, and that is um, these medieval Indian cookbooks. There are five of these. Um, you can find them in translation. They're sometimes hard to get hold of. Um, so if anyone's interested, I put my email, uh, my Facebook page at the beginning of um, the slide and you can, of the talk, and you can find my um, email and I'll be glad to tell you where you can get them. Um, there probably are other ones. These are just the ones that are in English translation. And these are the um, Loka Pakara, uh, which was originally written in Kannada in um, 1025. The Manasa Lhasa, which I think is the best known, um, which is again in Western India. Uh, the Nimat Nama, around the beginning of the 16th century, which is written in Urdu and Persian. And there's a beautiful uh, but expensive book put out by the, um, the uh, one of the museums in London, um, I think the British Museum, that has all the color illustrations. The Supa Shastra, which again is in Western India, and the um, Shema Kutu Halam, and forgive my Sanskrit, which is there. And these are, are very interesting because um, they were mainly written um, at royal courts, except for, I think for the first one, and the Sukha Shastra were written more with a more general audience. And um, they, they, they don't have recipes in the sense that we think of them like add two tablespoons, cook for three minutes, but they give you the ingredients of these dishes. And what's so interesting is that some of these dishes you can still find in these regions today, even though they're six, seven, eight hundred um, years old. Now, I won't go into great detail, detail about this. I have discussed it in more detail in my book, um, Feast and Fast. But just to give you an idea of what kind of things they include, um, the Loka Pakara, many of the dishes in this um, are for sweet and sweet and snack dishes. Um, first of all, because these are, you know, probably challenging to repair, or because this is what people really like to eat. They like to eat these things just as they do today. So this is another tradition that, you know, you find running through Indian food. Um, you can, um, they, they have a lot of dishes for lentils, which could be boiled, um, flavored with uh, tamarind, and garnished with mustard, cumin seed, asafoetida, and curry leaf, fly, fried in a little oil, which is the way people make lentils today. Um, other dishes with counterparts, especially in the region, are uh, mandiga, which is a thin can pancake filled with coconut, um, sugar, and sesame seed. Um, you have mango sikarni. And sikarni actually, or shikarni, is um, <clears throat> it's a predecessor of, um, of shrikhand. And again, this is a dish you find pretty much everywhere. You find it going back a thousand years. And it's made, of course, with, yog with strained yogurt. Uh, with sugar and spices and things like mango um, added. Um, you have um, um, a mixture of finely grated coconut, dates, and sugar stuffed into pieces of go dough and fried, which is a dish called sajapa, and it's still eaten today in, in, Karna in Karnataka, especially at festivals. And um, and these are a few other dishes that um, that I found from there, um, Savika, and that um, you can see. Now, uh, the Manasa Lhasa, actually, um, it is available in English translation. The translation is really very poor. I had to get um, a Sanskrit person, a person who knew Sanskrit, to translate passages for me. And I think a lot of these books do need uh, retranslating um, with people who know Sanskrit and who know English, and also who know about food. It's not enough just to know English, but you have to under, you know, you have to kind of understand how food is made to do a good translation of, of some of these works. So um, that's another area that there's opportunities. Um, the uh, Manasa Lhasa, um, uh, this was written for the, uh, the king of the region, um, 
uh, it was part of a, a larger work, which was kind of um, not just about food, but it was about all sorts of other things, about music, about gardening, about horses. Um, but the kings liked to show off their, their uh, expertise in these areas. They probably had ghost writers, but in any case, the, um, the king, Somi Suarez, listed as the uh, author of this. Um, one thing you had um, were dishes of white flour, uh, discs of white flour um, were sautéed to make a, a bread called mandakas, which is like a modern parata. Um, you had um, balls of uh, white flour that were baked in hot coals and were slightly charred, which is like the uh, modern Rajasthani batis. Um, you had uh, lentils uh, or chickpea flour um, mixed with various spices. They were ground to a paste, formed into little discs, and they were deep fried to make something called purika, which is a forerunner of modern papri. Um, and um, there are other dishes that were forerunners of vada. Um, you have a, a paste of uh, ground ura dal and pepper shaped into ball and deep fried to make vadika. And these were then soaked in milk or yogurt. And this modern incarnation is, of course, um, um, Um And um, so, but uh, King um, Somisfar and the other works I mentioned as well, um, really um, always pay obeisance to, um, to Ayurveda. And they often um, mention that, you know, these dishes are, uh, these dishes are, uh, correspond to what you see in Ayurveda. These dishes are healthy for this. So even in these cookbooks, there's a discussion of the health implications of the various dishes, which again is a trend that you find even today, of course, in a lot of writing about Indian food. Um, you also have, besides the Ayurveda tradition, you have the hot and cold tradition, although that's really more um, a folk tradition. And of course, what's hot and cold varies in different parts of India. So um, it's not always uh, totally consistent. Um, I want to talk a little about the um, Kshetha Kulam. Um, this was a Sanskrit treatise with verse written later than the Manasalasa. And um, the book, again, has a lot of recipes for sweet dishes and snacks. And um, if you look at the repertoire, it includes things like ladus, fenika, which are like modern feni, um, mandika, again, we have polika, you have, um, you have a dish called um, um, gurapura, which is like a, a sweet uh, puri filled with sweet dishes and um, many others. And, but the author's favorite is eggplant. And I like to quote this because he liked eggplant so much. He said, um, fie on the meal that has no eggplant, fie on the eggplant that has no stock, fie on the eggplant that has a stock, but is not cooked in oil, and fie upon the eggplant that is cooked in oil without using asafoetida. And he then proceeds to give 16 recipes for eggplant. And one is very much like the modern bacon barata. You um, cook the, a whole eggplant over heat till it's soft, and then you mash it, and then you mix it with um, mustard seed, um, salt, and yogurt, or of course in Bengal, you use mustard oil. So that's another, um, again, dish that goes back. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, cookbook, um, and it's called the Nimat uh, Nama by Agiat Shahi, and he was the ruler of a kingdom in Malwa um, around, the, around 1600. And when he came to the throne, around 1500, I should say, uh, he announced that he didn't want to rule anymore. He left the ruling of the kingdom to his son, Nasir Shah, and he wanted to devote his life to pleasure. And that he did with a vengeance. He had a huge harem and he had um, painters and he had painters both from Persia and from India. And um, during his reign, Mandu was known as Shadiabad or the city of joy. And um, what's interesting about this work, if you can get a copy, is you have about 50 of these beautifully illustrated paintings that um, illustrate the preparation of food. And in every or every picture, the Shah himself, and you can see him with this wonderful mustache that he has, he's either supervising the food, telling people how to make it, or he's eating it. And, um, and this is, um, and, and the paintings to start with are very Persian, but as it goes on, they get more and more Indian looking. Um, you can see the painting on the right, it's very much in the Persian tradition, the features of the people, the um, turbans. And then on the left, you can see how it's much more in the tradition of Indian painting. And, um, and the text itself is written in a mixture of Persian and Urdu, but unfortunately it's been translated. And um, the recipes are all for the Shah's 
favorite dishes. And they often have things like, oh, this dish is a favorite of Giyot Shah. But there's, there's a, maybe hundreds of these things. They're not in any order. There's a lot of repetition. Um, a friend of mine who knows, um, knows Persian Urdu and is a very good cook, we tried to reproduce some of these dishes based on the original. They didn't turn out very well. Um, I think, I mean, the actual directions are missing, but it was still um, fun to try this. Now, um, what's interesting is there's a mixture of both Persian and Indian styles, both in the painting and in the dishes. And many of the dishes have Persian, Persian names. And these are words that are even used today in India um, when they use the Urdu names. You have shorba for soup. You have khima, uh, minced meat. Um, you have duhuk, which is a yogurt dish. Naan, which is a Persian word meaning a baked bread. Yakni, um, you have kebabs or sikh. Um, you have um, harissa, um, you have um, kofta, biryani, but biryani here is a general word for baked food. It doesn't mean the rice dish we have today. Uh, you have faluda, um, and there's many more, sherbet. You obviously are of local origin, and many of these dishes are vegetarian, because I guess even, um, even Shahs want to have a break from all this rich food. I mean, we know that Akbar um, was virtually a vegetarian, um, and um, so um, I think that's a, that's a tradition. And the words in this book that do have, that are um, um, Sanskrit based as, as opposed to Persian based, you have things like dal, Ghee, um, puri, lassi, ladu, um, raita, um, and both puri and chapati are mentioned, but uh, not parata. And a few of these dishes are called garib, which of course means poor, or um, in this case, rustic, a poor man's dishes. And these are very simple dishes. So you have, for example, um, green vegetables boiled in water or dal. Um, flavored with vegetables and with hing. And that's very interesting because we always associate hing with Hindu cuisine. But in this case, um, in the um, in the um, in the Shah's court, it was used. He had breads um, made with millet grain. And again, millet was a very rustic food at one time and it was locally grown. And you have that in a dozen or so recipes. So I think this again is an example of continuity um, in Indian food so that um, you do have the uh, the introduction of, of dishes that, of course, some of these dishes didn't come from Persia, they came from the Delhi Sultanate. But again, um, you have these dishes that go back into antiquity that you find in this um, cookbooks. Um, another very interesting thing that's coming up is um, what you find today is a revival of some of these, um, these what are called lost foods, and um, or first foods, they're often called. Um, there's an interest in sustainability. And you have these really famous chefs, like the chef in, in Mumbai, um, um, that um, of um, Bombay, um, oh gosh, have to help me, uh, Bombay Canteen and um, others. And these chefs go, um, they go back, they go into the hinterlands and they try to find these foods that have disappeared. Interesting kinds of mushrooms, interesting kinds of greens, and they're incorporating them into their um, menus. And um, of course, the Center for Science and Health in Delhi has published two books called First Food Culture of Taste, which has recipes for these, um, these dishes. And um, they, they also call for the use of leaves, stalks, flowers, and seeds, and all parts of the plants. And it encourages readers to go out to their neighborhoods and explore for plants they can use. And um, these are, oh, Mask was the other restaurant I was thinking of, Pratik Sadhu in Mumbai, of course, he's another advocate of this kind of um, food. And these are just a couple that I found. One is a, a herb called Gotugala, Pennyworth, Moringa leaves. And of course, and I think the real star of the show these days has been millet. And the past few years, I've seen a great interest in millet, um, um, all kinds of barnyard millet, which was one something no middle class person would eat. And now you find it in, you know, five-star restaurants are serving it. And um, this is for partly for health reasons. Um, for diabetics, the, um, the glycemic index um, is, is lower than it would be for wheat. Um, it's not that much lower, but it still is lower. And, um, and so you find that um, this is another going back to the roots, so to speak, that, um, that people are doing. So um, just a few words in conclusion. Um, 
what defines Indian food today? Is, for, is there a pan-Indian cuisine? I know a few years ago, the government of India was trying to um, find a, a dish that um, could, they could, you know, add, promote as the all Indian uh, dish. Um, the only one that comes close is kitchari, actually. Um, an outlier when you try to find these dishes is always the Northeast, because the Northeast has so much of its own tradition. But even in the Northeast, there's kitchari. So I think if anything um, could be a, an all Indian dish, it is kitchari. And of course, it has multiple variations all over the country. But still, this combination of, of rice and lentils, or even um, lentils and millet, um, you have in Gujarat, you have, that was one of Shah, um, I think um, Jahangir's favorite dish was a Gujarati dish made of, um, of um, lentils and millet. So that's certainly one thing. Um, a second thing is um, the use of spices and mas masalas, which again, the spices, the mixtures differ, but certainly it's common to all parts of India. Again, in the Northeast, less than in other parts since they have their own herbs that they use, but I still think we can say this is um, a common feature. I think another um, common feature is that many street foods are becoming universal. Now, street food, of course, is, and if you go back, um, I mean, two, 3,000 BC, you, you, had, you had stands um, at the time of Ashoka, you had stands in village, you know, in, in cities that were, were selling prepared foods, that were selling snacks. This is certainly an integral part of Indian life is street food. And many are becoming universal. For example, chat, chat is an all India thing and it's various incarnations, Puri, Dati Puri, Pakri Chat, et cetera. Vadapav, once you found uh, mainly in, in uh, Maharashtra, now you can find that pretty much everywhere. Roasted corn, momos, which 20 years ago were relatively obscure, now they're everywhere, including here, and, uh, and chana masala. So I think this is another thing that is kind of um, becoming uh, a common feature. And also, finally, I think the media, especially TV cooking shows, are certainly uh, driving interest in a knowledge of regional cuisines. I mean, um, there are so many cooking shows. And even, I think even, gosh, 20, 25 years ago, um, when I visit my in-laws in Delhi, their, their Bengali cook, um, I don't know, some one day we wanted South Indian food. And he watched one of these TV cooking shows and made a very good, uh, you know, a dosa and things like that. So again, I think these are things that, um, in a way are, are bringing the country together. And um, I think the Indian government, now they're finally beginning to look at food tours and promoting food tours in which other countries, Malaysia, Thailand, have certainly been doing um, investing and Korea too. I mean, I just read recently over 40% of tourists to Korea now go for the food because the Korean government has made a, a great um, and effort in putting money, encouraging it, even, even helping to fund Korean restaurants. And certainly in Chicago, I would say Korean food is much more widespread and probably popular than Indian food. So um, I just want to conclude with that remark. Thanks so much, Colleen. That was fascinating. Food evolves, right? But there, even in that evolution, there is this continuity. There's this string that uh, connects us to our past. And when you made the references to the Vedas, I mean, the number of, I mean, they love their food because a lot of the shlokas are about the food, about the malpuas, about the, the ghee and the taste of ghee and mm, how it ghee. comes mm. out. So, I mean, they were foodies. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great that uh, scholars like you are sitting and going through these uh, ancient texts and uh, putting together the history of Indian food. Many thanks for joining us, Colleen. And um, I look forward to your next project after six, six books, seven books. So well, my next book that I'm actually I'm finally getting the proofs for is is not food. It's um, a history of the Maurya dynasty in Ashoka. And that's that's what references to the street food during the Mauryan period. That's where it came from. Yeah, but uh, I'm really fascinated by by that period. It's, it's so interesting. So, that, so thank you so much. Our next discussion with you, Colleen. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me, Minnie. Thank you.